It was frustrating, it was scary, but ultimately it was rewarding. We all along knew that it was the right thing to do because A, at that point we had product market fit. We were serving artists in a great way. That's Oscar, the founder of Epidemic Sound. They have a valuation of 1.2 billion. They've raised from some top investors in the world like Blackstone and they're doing 130 million ARR, but it wasn't always like that. He shares the story of how they overcame the challenge of legislation. You only have like three choices. You can make it, break it, or take it. So what I mean by that is you either put in the hours and you try and make legislation. So you, so you go to Washington or you go to Brussels and you try and really invest time and resources creating the world that you want. If you don't make it, you can maybe break it. And I think that's very popular among startups. Like people say that's run fast and break things and taxi world or delivery, and you just build something and you have so much momentum and velocity, you just break rules and then they have to rewrite themselves. Or the third one is basically you take it. And so if you don't invest, you play by the rules and you opt for, let's ask for permission instead of asking for forgiveness, then you have to succumb to the rules and the compromises which typically so sort of don't really benefit if you're an innovator if you're building a marketplace you're going to love this because he shares how they built both sides of the marketplace and of course if you have to deal with any government regulations you're going to get some good insights and inspirations enjoy it boom Welcome to Sit Down Startup Founder Podcast. We interview the best founders in the world and ask them what they did in the early days, right before that hockey stick growth moment. I'm your host, Adam O'Donnell, a former founder. I live here in San Francisco and I now work for Zendesk for Startups. Zendesk is a customer support platform and we offer six months free to qualified product-oriented startups. This week's partner shout out goes to Every.io. They do AI-enabled bookkeeping and taxes. Definitely check them out. I am super excited to have Oscar Hoagland from Epidemic Sound on the podcast today. It would just if you could first by just flexing for a second, just for anyone who doesn't know, how much money have you raised? How big are you? Sure. So um, I run a company called Epidemic Sound. We've been around for about 14 years. We've raised north of $100 million. We turn over north of $130 million now. We are a SaaS business. Uh, I have a beautiful cap table with, um, besides employees and co-founders, um, some uh, outstanding investors, including EQT and Blackstone from the US. I think our last funding round was at 1.2 billion US dollars. And so um, we're in the business of making music and we're trying to soundtrack the internet. I love that. How long did you wait before starting the company in your first race? Because you clearly waited more than most companies. Um, yes, we did. Um, that was actually by design. And it was um, it was the case that when we launched Epidemic, uh, there were five co-founders and we were not first time founders. And so fortunately, we had stumbled and fallen and built and eventually succeeded before that. And so between us, we had multiple different careers and also different businesses. And so we were fully self-financed for the first couple of years and so we didn't take on seed investment i'm actually quite anti the whole structural approach of raising capital i think it's intuitively weird that so people who start businesses are obviously excited about chance and serendipity and they sort of take a step away from structure and being an employee and yet the entire venture capital business is trying to bend backwards to precisely say that this is a seed round and this is an A round and this is a B round and this is the deck and this is the number and this is the person. So I've never used any of those acronyms. And so we waited many, many years until we raised. We just used our own money, which was great because we got to call the shots and make the mistakes and also eventually get to the right point. And so hence we've raised way less than most other companies because we could bootstrap our business and finance everything ourselves and call our own shots. That's a really cool point that I think uh, during down markets, people, it, it's exposed the the real shortcomings of following that process of, mm -hmm. of raising these sequences and all that. So that's that's really neat. Well, to, to kind of transition a bit, I want to understand because everyone sees, people are going to see the flashy title in this podcast of how much money you've raised or that you're doing about 130 million a year, like all that stuff. But I know that it wasn't always like that. So is there a low moment that you could tell us in the early days, maybe even a point where you're like, man, I don't know if the company is going to continue. Um, so I would argue that there have been quite a few. Um, I think that as you were talking before, uh, there's this expression, which I love, which is being a cockroach capitalist. 
Um, and if you're not familiar with cockroaches, they're incredibly hard to kill, right? And so I think that's one of the most important superpowers to have as a co-founder and as a company builder and an entrepreneur is to be resilient because it is typically going to take way longer than you anticipate. It's going to be way more difficult. But if you're fortunate to get sort of through that tough part, it's going to be um, definitely worth it. And I think that as I look back, there have been multiple points in time when you're either up against um, like conflict amongst people. There can be fine. There were financing issues um, at multiple different um, um, points in time. There was competition there was changes in the marketplace we work in the world of copyright so copyright law got rewritten around the world in both the us and europe during the last 10 years so there was some um, near-death moments there as well um but so yeah I'll, I'll pause there so quite a few different sort of venues or areas of uh, of, of near-death moments man and i hope that that alone is is a word for founders who are listening right now, that it's not about that these flashy things are kind of fruits that happen when you focus on the hard things and try to keep things going. So could you, maybe one of those we could pick. I would love to hear about the the copyright one, because that's something that's a force that's outside of your control. Yeah. Let's dive into the copyright one. Um, before I do, however, Adam, there's this expression, which I gladly steal from another Swedish entrepreneur, uh, one of the founders of Spotify, actually. And I think he famously at some point in time said, the value of a company is typically the sum of the problems that they solve, right? And I think there's something poetic to that because if, if, if you go about building a company and you use that as your principle, as in the value of the company is the sum of the problems you solve, as soon as you hit upon problems, that's not an obstacle. That's an opportunity to increase the value of your company, right? And so I think that ultimately I always have a Rubik's Cube around me because I'm a problem solver. I love solving Rubik's Cubes and building a company is all about constantly solving problems and solving different Rubik's Cubes. And so if you have that mindset, as soon as you hit a snag, you get to a problem. It doesn't really get you down. It gives you an opportunity to increase the value of your company, right? Because you're typically solving, if you're thinking about it the right way, problems for yourself, but more importantly, for your customers and for your users. Um, and maybe that's a good transition back into your question. So we're in the business of copyright and we create music and we had this notion that we wanted to soundtrack the internet. We saw early on because we came from TV production and storytelling and, and music that um, adding music to content was really important. Uh, the equivalent of adding sort of, uh, flavor to food, if you will. Um, but at the same time, it was very difficult because copyright was so antiquated, it was so complex, it hinged on old rules from the 17th century, the 18th century. Uh, it wasn't fit for purpose. It didn't scale well as the internet transitioned from being tech-centric to eventually being picture-centric and then video-centric. The music that was supposed to bring that video to life couldn't traverse country borders. It couldn't go from platform to platform, from company to company, because publishers and PROs and copyright was constantly breaking down. And so we re-engineered all of that, we simplified it, and we made it way easier. Uh, but in the same process, there was an overarching uh, endeavor to try and change copyright. And we got to a point where we were being so, so successful at that point in time that the encumbrance in the old industry tried to revert and change legislation to make life more difficult for us, to try and rewrite the history books or rewrite the copyright laws so that they would be advantageous to the encumbrance and make life difficult for the new entrants. Um, and that was very much a David versus Goliath. So flying down sort of into sort of the world of politics, which is very different from the world of startups and scale ups. That was a scary, scary point in time. Wow. So can you take us into maybe even a, a meeting where you were like, I don't know if, th if this doesn't go in our favor, like we might not be able to solve this problem despite like the whole value. Um, I definitely can. I mean, politics is, I'm not sure if it makes for great content in a podcast. I'll try and put it in a context so it, so I don't put your listeners to sleep, but politics mm -hmm. is 
it's a long winding road with tons of compromises where I think the ultimate goal is nobody is supposed to be super happy. That's when politicians high five and they go like, yes, we did a good job because nobody's really happy. Um, and so uh, thinking about it that way, I think is slightly depressing, but it's, it's also funny because it's true. And so going down to Brussels was a lot about understanding who were the movers and shakers, who were the right people? How did you position your argument so that you um, could um, appeal to the different stakeholders? So it was very much a case of understanding the field, understanding the different uh, opinions of different rights holders, but also stakeholders, um, and then being a fairly good communicator. I think that sort of um, speaking on your behalf, but also ultimately we were in a position where we could speak on the behalf of all music creators who were smaller and not typically sort of the big juggernauts. And that obviously goes a very far away if you're sort of leaning towards politics, which they want to create a level playing field. They want to um, address competition issues. They don't like uh, monopolies. Uh, they don't like tariffs. And seeing as we were against all of those, sort of what was the... I forget who the expression, but showing up, Woody, Woody Allen maybe said like showing up is like 80% of success. So just sort of going down to Brussels, taking the fight, making those trips and making the arguments got us a long way. But it was far from obvious that we would be listened to and that's a reason would 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 win. But ultimately, sort of, that was very much what happened. But when when you're accustomed to being a grinder, as as you, myself, the people listening on this podcast, you like agency, agency, and you like to be able to do things yourself and to um, have influence over the outcome. Whereas politics is the exact opposite. Like somebody else calls the shots, and you can only bring your opinion, and you hope that you're listened to. And so that's humbling and it's scary, and but it's ultimately very, very important that you understand that. Oh my gosh! So yeah, you you picked a battle. And you went and did something that was seemed to be opposite of like getting to product market fit, but yet you knew this was the right battle to pick and fighting it ultimately knowing that you could completely lose and it's, it is outside of your control. You can make the best argument, but what, what a humbling situation. I'm sure just the feelings that you had going there and spending that time has been frustrating. Yeah, it was, um, it was frustrating. It was scary, but ultimately it was rewarding. And I think that we all along knew that it was the right thing to do because a, at that point, we had product market fit. So we knew already that we were serving artists in a great way. We were helping them get a voice, a platform, distribute their music across the internet. We had our generation's most prolific storytellers falling in love with their tracks, using them, giving them distribution. We had content creators finally sort of um, enjoying working with music and with, uh, with copyright in a much more modern context, which we could provide for them. And so we felt very encouraged that we were doing the right thing and we were on the right side of history. Um, but that said, I think legislation, you only have like three choices. You can make it, break it, or take it. So what mm -hmm. I mean by that is you either put in the hours and you try and make legislation. So you, so you go to Washington or you go to Brussels and you try and really invest time and resources in making, sort of creating the world that you want to, to see come to fruition. Um, if you don't make it, you can maybe break it. And I think that's very popular among startups. Like people say that's run fast and break things. And it can be sort of taxi world or delivery or sort of regulation or housing or hotels and whatnot. And you just build something and you have so much momentum and velocity that you don't really address rules. You just break rules and then they have to rewrite themselves. And so I think that's option number two. Well, the third one is basically you take it. And so if you don't invest, you play by the rules and you opt for, let's ask for permission instead of asking for forgiveness, then you have to succumb to the rules and the compromises, which typically sort of don't really benefit if you're an innovator. They tend to benefit the encumbrance. Uh, so previous monopolies who have a lot of sway or a lot of um, influence in, in, in the corridors at Washington, sort of, I don't know, maybe... Uh, security and, and those kind of questions sort of lend themselves well in, in that category. But um, take it, make it or break it. I think you need, mm. to, you need to have an opinion. Oh, that's so good. Well, could, could you take us back to the beginning days back in, was it around 2009 that you started the company? Yes. Yeah. It may, it, just helping us understand like the, what it took for you to get conviction to start sure. going um, all in on this. 
I think I can break it down in, in, in a couple of distinct steps. And so the first thing that we set out to do was to solve two problems, which we stumbled upon. And so the first one was um, a few of us, as I said, we were five co-founders. So a few of us were working in TV production and making TV shows around the world. So the goal with a dragon tattoo is like a good example. Um, and adding music to content ought to be like a creative, fun, inspirational process where you cross your T's and dot your I's and your content comes to life. Like I said, it's it's the umami of food. So it's it's the taste element which makes your content unforgettable. Um, that was not the case. Like adding music to content was a nightmare. You were terrified about making a mistake, getting sued. There was no product. There was no user interface. There was no scalability. It was hardly even online because everyone was afraid of a virus. And so we took a step back and we said that, yikes, like we don't want to live in a world where adding music to content is horrendous. It ought to be the exact opposite. We'd like to fix that. So that was the demand side problem that we saw. And then we switched to the supply side, which was the artists. And we saw that the music industry was beautiful on paper. And so it was, it hinges around royalty. And so the concept is that we all laugh together and cry together because the upside will scale with distribution. But the dirty little secret was that the system was rigged, didn't really work. There was 1% who could support themselves, but the other 99% were exploited. They never got paid for anything because everyone spoke about these royalties that never materialized. So artists were succumbing to working at the post office or at uh, grocery stores or, or in a warehouse somewhere because they couldn't support themselves. And meanwhile, the intermediaries in the music industry were typically quite well off. So record labels, publishers, PROs, managers had most favored nation clauses and they had clout and they had sort of first class tickets everywhere and they all had assistance and whatnot. And so the industry didn't really work. And so the second thing that we said was, what if we can help build a music industry where music creators make tons of money? What if the music industry was optimized for creators and artists as opposed to middlemen? Wouldn't that be something? So those were the two first problems that we set out to solve. Um, then I think earlier than most, we came, we had front row seats because we worked with content and, and um, technology. So we could see that the internet in its infancy was very tech centric. People were texting away. And then over time, we came to realize and we saw stuff like Instagram and other things. And so pictures seemed to happen as well, right? As compute power and processes allowed for more sophisticated content. But then we were very, very determined and we were completely convinced that over time, the modus operandi of the internet, like the interface will be video because it's a much more convenient way for our species to interact. It carries more information, it carries emotion. Like if, if the compute power is there, the internet is gonna be video. And so we saw these steps and these transitions and we thought like, huh, it's kind of cool. And I think when we saw the opportunity, the transition, uh, when we saw the two problems that needed solving, I think it all came together for us in terms of what we wanted to achieve. Um, okay. For me, at least, it, it comes very much down to uh, how I'd like to contribute or maybe how you and I or we get to be remembered in, in, in the future. And so the way I think about it is that I'm in downtown Stockholm now and it's been a beautiful day. And at some point, 20 years from now, I like to think that I'll be heading downtown with a grandkid. And at some point she's going to look at me and she's going to go, granddad, I've done a bit of thinking and I've come to understand that your generation, like you almost destroyed the planet because of the environment, but thankfully you sort of, you reversed that last second. Um, and when all was said and done, like your, your generation's biggest contribution, like what put you on the map and what all future generations thank you for is that you invented the internet. Like that's so incredibly profound because it's at the core of AI, entertainment, education, how we interact, how we shop, how we bank, how we express ourselves, how we carry our culture forward. Like the internet is the foundation of our civilization and you invented that. That's so incredibly inspiring. And I get all teared up and we high five and we head to a candy store because I'm going to be a bad grandparent. And then we used to leave the candy store and she's going to be eating sweets and she's going to look at me again and she's going to have a frown. And then she's going to go, but granddad, if your generation now invented the internet and that's the most pivotal piece of um, ingenuity that your, our species created during your lifetime, can you remind me, how did you contribute to that? What was your role? 
Should I be embarrassed for our family name? Did you realize what was happening? Did you throw your hat in the ring? Ultimately, did you contribute in any way, shape or form to your generation's most important achievement? And that's obviously a big question. So my hands are sweaty. I'm old as we sit down at a bench, but there's a smile so that creeps up on my face because like a big bunch of us at Epidemic, like we've had these kind of fictitious discussions with ourselves and we've thought about these questions and we've built many different companies before. And we came to the conclusion that wouldn't it be amazing if we could have that kind of a discussion in the future and we get to lean into future generations and we say that, you know what? We 100% saw what was going on and we took a long, hard thing. And the best thing we could come up with was that we thought it would be super cool if we could say to future generations, you know what? We saw exactly what was going on and we decided what better way than to try and soundtrack all of the internet. What if we unleash music and creativity to our generation's biggest collective achievement? Make sure that the internet is this rich depository of all the best sort of cultural expressions of our species from all across the planet. We'll re-engineer the music industry. We'll lean into technology. We make sure that the internet is this sort of incredible gift that keeps on giving that we're really, really proud of. And we think that in that process, we can build like a multi-billion dollar business. We get to work with music, creativity, technology, AI. We get to lean into the future and build a huge part of what makes our species interesting. Like storytelling is our species' oldest trait. And we're taking that into the new digital world. That's mm. the, the semi-long version of like what it is we do. And when we knew that we were onto something big, like that's when that moment hit. Like this is worth fighting for. This is work. This is worth working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. This gets people excited. This sort of allows talent to leave their mundane, boring jobs mm -hmm. that they typically sort of have been with previously and hop on a rocket ship that's trying to do something different. Mm. That is so good because it's much bigger than you. And, mm -hmm. and your, your perspective is so much bigger than like, let's just get in this company and get the exit and get out. And you've already done that before and you see the emptiness in that and you're, you're once again building another company. So you're like, I want to do it for the long haul here. I want to make a big lasting impression. It's all about sort of understanding you're either a problem solver or you're not. When you've solved the Rubik Cube, people think that you're excited, but you're filled with emptiness. I want to scramble mm -hmm. it again and I want to go after sort of solving a problem. It's the same if you've been incredibly fortunate because it comes down to luck and hard work and other stuff. But if you built businesses and you've made exits or partial exits, I think that most people can testify that there's a there's an ever so slight sense of sort of Rocky running up the sort of stairs and you're pumping your fists. It's like, yeah, you made it. But then the feeling directly afterwards is just emptiness because the Rubik's Cube is solved. And it's like, okay, now what? Like, what do I spend my time on? Because I think you either are a problem solver or you're not. Hmm. I think it's that, that is so good. There's a trip that um, I'm fortunate to go on each year. It's a kite serving trip with a bunch of founders and VCs. And like some of the founders have founded some pretty big companies, some that you might know of. And that's been the common theme that I've consistently heard is that the, that bub they're like, they pop the bubble. Like once you have the exit to Microsoft, Facebook, whatever, some of these companies did, mm -hmm. there's like this huge depression that happens with most builders because yeah. that's what they love doing. So yeah. That's, I think yeah, it's true. That's so um, I, I think another comparison, um, Adam, is that uh, I grew up in Great Britain. And so I was born in London. And I remember as a kid on television, they would show something called greyhound racing, which are these huge dogs that look like rats a little bit. And they run around in a, in a greyhound arena. And what they do is they have this mechanical hair as a rabbit, which is what they release. And the dogs run like crazy to go get the rabbit. And do you know what the worst sort of thing that sort of can possibly happen in that context, and it happens once in a while, it's that they have a technical glitch and that the rabbit stops moving and the dogs catch up to the rabbit and they bite the rabbit. And if they do, they never run again. So they can be top of their game, but it's all about trying to catch the rabbit. As soon as they do, they never run again. And I think it's... Sort of the, there's something in there about building companies, right? It's all about the pursuit and the struggle and the exercise and the training. Mm -hmm. But it, once you get the rabbit, it's like, okay, so it's a game over. It's not fun anymore. It's the pursuit. It's the problem mm -hmm. solving. It's the, it's the work that is a part of the re reward. And I know it's, so it's 
it's much easier, obviously, to say that if you've been super fortunate and you've had um, partial exits along the way. I'm the first to recognize that. So I work with music, right? I'm, I'm probably the least musical person within our company. Um, I sang once to my wife and we looked at each other and we said, okay, yeah, that's never going to happen again because <laughs> you need to understand what your skill sets are and more importantly, what they're not. Um, but I think that being a musician and especially a songwriter is very, very lonely and it's quite difficult because if you're tasked with writing a hit, like Adam, sit down and give me a hit. The only thing I can promise you is that that's not going to materialize. A hit comes to you or sort of the lyrics, the music, um, the magic happens when you're not focused on it, when you're doing something else, something that you're passionate about. You mentioned kite surfing before. So when you're hitting a wave or you're sort of getting that air or something is happening, you're in your zen, you're in your moment, you have flow. That's when I think your brain does the best thinking. That's when you wander off and just something sticks, something strikes a chord. And that's where you sort of get to those magic moments where you really see progress and you get masterpieces. And so I think that building a business is similar to writing a hit. So you, you can't really go on a camp and sit down and write a hit. You have to be preoccupied doing other things that you love with people that inspire and that you that you respect. And in that context, then those things will happen as a byproduct. That's so good. And Oscar, this has been one of my favorite interviews. Just the last question is, what is your superpower? Because I know you we've, Touched, touched around it, but how would you frame it? If I have a superpower, I think it's that I am. My brother once told me that I'm trustworthy in the sense that sort of, I think I'm a fairly good listener and I understand people uh, and context quite well. And as such, I think I, I am I'm good at persuading people. Sometimes I'm good at telling a story. Uh, and so painting a picture, getting people excited, making people feel something. I think that's something which I'm, I'm quite good at. I'm surprisingly bad at many other things. I want to be super clear on that, but I think that that's, I'm, I'm good at building teams of so getting people excited, mm -hmm. getting them together, uniting around a cause, a purpose, and then sort of making sure that we hit that cause, hit that purpose at pace and off we go. That I think is I my superpower. It. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Adam. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you want to learn more about Zendesk for startups, check out our website, zendesk.com slash startups. Also, we're always looking to improve. So don't hesitate to email me with any feedback on how we can ask better questions, guess the target, or anything else so we can do to better help you as a founder. My email is adam.odonnell at zendesk.com. 